Mr. Kiran Karnik, Chairman of the Board of Governors for IIIT Delhi, Professor Ranjan Bose, Director of IIIT Delhi, members of the faculty, and of course, members of the student body, 500 plus graduating students. But let me extend a particular congratulations to the 100th PhD uh, student from IIIT Delhi. Wonderful achievement. <clears throat> Namaskar, thank you so much for inviting me to your 11th convocation. And of course, as I realize, uh, you've not ma ha managed to have a convocation in person for two years. It's been online, so I'm particularly excited to be back here uh, as we were unveiling the plaque uh, a few meters away. I was seeing the parents and the students taking photographs. It took me back to when I was graduating. Um, it's obviously a ex extremely exciting time, so I would request all of you to put a big smile on your faces. Don't look so, so solemn. It is a solemn occasion, but it is also an extremely happy occasion. Um, I am, of course, truly humbled to be here for several reasons. First of all, I'm in the company of those for whom I have deep respect. Mr. Kiran Karnik uh, engaged in one of CEW's key projects um, on global governance when, it, when we as an institution were just four months old uh, and has been, of course, a guide and a well-wisher ever since. But he might not recall, but uh, I first met him in the year I graduated uh, from university at a conference. This was before even the new millennium had begun, at a conference on digital technologies and education. So, so much has happened since then and so much has uh, remains the same in a way. I, I understand that you here have created uh, several interdisciplinary research centers on AI, design, healthcare, sustainable mobility, some of which uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ranjan Bose referred to, the new center on quantum computing, the center on human-centered computing, the first medical robotic center. Um, I want to congratulate the university for its focus on driving innovation towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, your previous director, Professor Jalote's initiative, uh, <clears throat> NVEV, is something I've been engaged with for more than a year, and I'm inspired by his vision to bring talent and innovation towards solving problems. Secondly, if I may take a personal turn, I'm in the company of a friend and my colleague, Karthik Ganeshan, and whose wife, Professor Shobha Sundaram, is a senior faculty member here. Thanks to them, I have visited this campus on many occasions before, but it is the first time that I'm delivering a lecture here. And I know they have a very high bar, so I hope I meet it. Thirdly, as a non-engineer, I'm here with much humi humility, but also a bit of glee. To my wife, Meghna Narayan, who is also a computer science engineer here, she's seated here, and is now a remarkable entrepreneur of nutritious food, I have this message. See, I didn't get an engineering degree, but I did give away some. <laughs> you know, jokes, jokes aside, this is an important occasion, a solemn occasion, when so many of you graduate from one stage of life and enter another. I remember when I graduated, just before the turn of the millennium. Two years earlier, India had celebrated its 50th anniversary of independence. And by the end of the decade, India had survived multiple financial crises. It had opened its economy. Its IT sector was getting noticed across the world. And it was soon to be declared an emerging power. Today, it is the 75th year of India's independence. And before you know it, one of you will be delivering a convocation lecture in the year of our centenary. There are many other turns that are underway now, thanks to technology, the economy, society, and politics. I'll come to these issues later, but right now I have a very straightforward message for you. you know, human beings are very dexterous creatures. With our simple, opposable thumbs, we've been able to hold things shape tools, and build complex marvels, from bridges spanning canyons to rockets shooting into space. 
From early childhood, we train our kids to hold a pencil and draw a line. We congratulate those who do the neatest work. As a child, I would enjoy those puzzles that would connect seemingly scattered numbered dots to eventually reveal a figure that was more familiar, like a car or a dog. This simple game is at the heart of the message I want to give you today. What are you more fascinated by? The neatness of the lines connecting the dots. My wife has often told me about the engineering drawing exams that she was often int uh, intimidated by. Or are you fascinated by the final drawn outcome? Or are you fascinated by the scatter plot itself? My message to you is, be curious about all three. The randomness of the world we inhabit. The dexterity and the process with which you will thread a narrative across that landscape. And of course, the beauty that will emerge from your actions. Engineers, you are trained to design and build. The engineer's world is a system of measures and the precise relationships between them. The engineer's world is also one of imagination, without which we would neither have the pyramids nor the flush toilet. But that imagination is also limited by the parameters of what seems to be physically possible. The engineer is therefore frustrated by variables that are not always quantifiable, let alone predictable. If you think I'm beating up on engineers, don't worry. I'm trained as an economist. Our tribe tends to get frustrated if the world does not fit our assumptions. But this tension between engineered order and societal chaos defines much of how human societies have flourished and perished. So ask this. We are intrigued by the innovation and the orderliness, say, of the sewerage system of the Harappa civilization. But 4,000 years later, why do we have overflowing sewers and drains in a city such as Bangalore, which boasts of tens of thousands of engineers? Or just ask this. Just 65 years after the first man-made satellite was launched into space, we now have the capability to engineer and deploy thousands of microsatellites, not just by heavily funded and secretive national programs, but also those designed by students and launched via private launch vehicles. And yet, why are we moving backwards from the rules that govern humanity's behavior in outer space? Every month, for instance, we are losing one more percentage point of the remaining carbon space that is left for us on the planet. And while we have the technologies, why do we not have the ability to hold ourselves accountable for our actions? So I know you're not probably keen on sitting more exams, but I will still pose a problem statement. How does the engineer who designs using parameters within their control factor in the contingencies over which they hold little sway. So let me illustrate this with four examples. First, the success of technology versus the failure of society. We are living in a technocentric world. Technological breakthroughs and widespread dissemination of the same have driven a lot of the productivity growth in the last three to four decades. Land, labor, capital, of course, remain variables of growth, but the X factor has been technology. The internet has been the most consequential tech advancement of our times. Its widespread use has now created new opportunities from digital identity to delivering to devices speaking to each other uh, for more optimized production and consumption of goods and services. Even in the late 90s, when I was applying for grad school, my access to the internet was limited to a kiosk in the market from where I typed out my application essays. But today, 63% of the world's population is connected to the internet. At the same time, in 2020, a quarter of the world's population did not have safely managed drinking water, and half of the world's people did not have safely managed sanitation. 
In the 12 months to October 2022, 170 million people got connected to the internet. With a simplistic linear projection, by this time in 2030, another 1.4 billion people would have become internet users. And yet on current trends, there will remain 1.6 billion people without access to safe drinking water and 2.8 billion people without access to safe sanitation. Advances in biology and computing power will drive a lot of the emerging technologies in the coming years. Of course, Mr. Karnick just talked about vaccines, which were developed within 12 months of the coronavirus having been detected, shrinking a process that takes years into just a few months. But now consider counterfactual. Suppose COVID-19 were not a global pandemic, but a pan-Africa disease. Would we have got a vaccine so quickly? Would we have had a vaccine at all? Despite pneumococcal disease being the ki biggest killer of children, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines were not developed at scale until the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization placed an advanced market commitment to buy millions of doses. And of course now, because of that program, 215 million children have been vaccinated in 60 countries. So the point is that our technocentric worldview is only a partial one. We should certainly celebrate the success of technology, but we should also acknowledge the failure of society. It is relatively easier to, de to design a device that purifies water. It is much harder to create the political buy-in for safe provision of water and sanitation. It is much easier to sell an air purifier Frustratingly difficult to create a democratic demand for clean air. Technology cannot fix a planet if the people who inhabit it don't want to save it or themselves. Example number two, energy transitions versus a global energy disorder. Since the time when humans figured out how to start a fire, energy has been at the heart of human civilization. India is going through four energy transitions. Two of them are well underway, namely access to modern energy services for hundreds of millions of people, and its shift towards rapid urbanization, which will change the energy patterns in buildings such as these, in our industries, in our transport systems. In 2015, when the Sustainable Development Goals were announced, India had the dubious distinction of having the largest number of people without access to energy. Now, more than 98% of our households are collect, connected to electricity. More than 80% of households have access to clean cooking energy. But while this is a creditable achievement, we should particularly credit the electrical engineers who worked at the last mile, day and night, to electrify 28 million homes in just 18 months. But there are two other transitions we are going through which are more complex. With growing energy demand, India will get more deeply integrated into global energy markets. But it must meet this energy demand within a shrinking carbon constraint. Of course, there are technological solutions. When we set up CW in 2010, India had just 20 megawatts of solar. Today it has 60,000 megawatts of solar power 165,000 megawatts of non-fossil electricity capacity, and it will be the first major economy that will build more renewable energy than its entire electricity system this decade. This breathless marathon of building renewables, 10 megawatts every hour, 10 hours a day, six days a week, 52 weeks a year for the rest of this decade is a materials challenge, a manpower challenge, a money challenge but it is also a geopolitical challenge. The Russia-Ukraine crisis has sent oil and gas prices skyrocketing. This could be a moment to double down on clean energy, but if we shift it from importing 80% of our oil to importing 80% of our solar modules, have we really become more energy secure? To be sure, no country has achieved energy independence. Of course, leaders across the world keep promising, but what we need is more interdependence for energy security. And that leads to the other challenge. There is no energy security architecture that serves the energy interests 
of emerging economies like ours and the emerging energy technologies of the future. Those rules to govern those technologies that are being invented are still missing. Example number three, the globalization of everything versus the weaponization of everything. Since the end of the Cold War, the last three decades, a new wave of globalization swept the world. Goods, services, and ideas were to flow freely. Erstwhile closed economies opened up. New institutional frameworks, such as the World Trade Organization, emerged. This wave of globalization was built on common principles. Non-discrimination among trading partners, interoperability of standards and regulations for technology, a degree of differentiation of the responsibilities of rich and poor countries. For rich countries, new markets opened. For developing countries, the prospect of rising per capita incomes was attractive. This was the grand bargain for the last 30 years. 30 years of globalization of everything is now yielding a new reality, the potential weaponization of everything. Trade rules are designed to get economies to lower trade barriers to importing and buying things. But how do we force a country to sell things? What do we do if a supplier of critical minerals refuses to sell those critical minerals which are at the heart of our advanced technologies? At the height of the Cold War, we had an outer space treaty to prevent weaponization of space. And yet we are now faced with the prospect of an ungoverned cosmos, with state and non-state actors having the power to paralyze our communications, our economies, and our defense networks. The growing political tensions between China and the US are resulting in policies and laws in these countries emerging in a way that you're restricting the access to technology. And as a result, the principles guiding international behavior are shifting. Rather than non-discrimination, we now have emerging blocks of trade, minerals, technology. We have islands of regulation, Rather than convergence of our economic systems, we have divergence of political interests and less multilateral cooperation. In effect, the same technological advances that drove a lot of our recent economic prosperity are also the ones that are now being subjected to more geographical and jurisdictional control. So is there an antidote to such engineered disorder? Should we create trade blocks or more common markets? Will economics dictate political relationships? Or will the strategic calculus for the economy be measured by what Karl, Karl von Clausewitz said, war with other means? So my final example, reforming multilateralism versus a global economic ungovernance. Against the backdrop of these tensions, there is growing cynicism across the world about the possibility of global cooperation. This world is facing compounding crises. There's a food crisis, a fuel crisis, a finance crisis, and a continuing fever crisis in the form of the pandemic. At the halfway mark of the Sustainable Development Goals, many targets are out of reach. Natural resources are getting exhausted. Carbon space is shrinking. Fiscal resources are stretched. Currency reserves are dwindling. Unlike 1945, at the end of the world, Second World War, when we created new institutions like the World Bank and so forth, today we need global multilateral banks to deliver resilience. Unlike 1945, when the locus of economic power was also where the countries that generated their own currencies, now the locus of economic power is with emerging economies like India, while countries that are printing currencies are elsewhere. There is a need, therefore, to increase the role of the global south and close the ever-widening gap on technology. We can't build a sustainable planet that widens rather than narrows the technology gap. So we need a new paradigm of technology co-development. This requires joint research, pooling resources, financial and human, managing risks and liability. Let me give you one example. Distributed renewable energy, which can be used for livelihoods in rural India, is a $53 billion investment opportunity. It's a huge 
fortune at the so-called bottom of the pyramid. But are we creating the frameworks by which we can enable that the advanced technologies are today are going to the most vulnerable? And therefore, let me come to my final provocation. Engineered efficiency versus the agency of engineers. Remember the scatter plot, the connector lines, and the final picture? In each of the examples I've shared with you, the final picture is less clear. The lines are less straight, and the number of dots to connect are many. So I hope my examples have illustrated why technology is an enabler, but not the end point, and why I wish that you are curious about the dots, the lines, and the pictures. The legacy of engineers is not in what you build, but in how your invention is used. The phone I use is the same that millions have, but my engagement with the phone is uniquely mine. And that is where good design comes in. The way energy flows in a house, the way traffic flows on a bridge, the way water flows through an irrigation pump, the way cotton is converted into textile that goes into my shirt, all are examples of good design that can yield an engineered efficiency. But there is also the agency of engineers. You can design, as Mr. Karnick said, not just for efficiency, but for good. You can question whether technology is celebrating its own success or is it being put to the service of society? You can look over the horizon at emerging technologies for a cleaner energy future, but you'd also have to anticipate and prevent resource-related conflict. You have a choice of remaining within tech-centric bubbles or to reimagine the relationship between corporations, countries, and global institutions, all with the citizen at the center. The world we have inherited was not like this. It took two world wars, decades of a cold war, and much human misery for us to design an interdependence that was to deliver a better and a common good. That social contract at the national level and that grand bargain at the global level is now fraying. This is the world into which you are entering your professional lives. This is the world that India will have to navigate as it seeks to become a developed economy. This is the flawed world that our beautiful planet has to contend with. This is also the world of possibilities, of cleaner air, safer streets, better food. The basics, you might think, but this is where your innovation and your ingenuity is needed the most. The world where conflict is not eliminated, where consensus is not always achieved, but where respectful, interdependent, and resilient cohabitation is the desired goal. Will you use your skills, your networks, your technologies, your agency to shape such a world? I'm sure many of you chose to become engineers because you like the orderliness of the variables you can control. For the things that you make, may you design them well. You will go ahead and build the world. But I also hope that at least some of you are excited by the millions of permutations that dots and lines can make, generating new possibilities, not just in the built environment, but in the natural, the societal, the economic, and even our political environments. May you be courageous to attempt that change. You will go ahead and shape the world. So many congratulations again. Engineers, may you not just build the world, but shape it in a better image. Thank you.